In this video, we'll discuss the story that happened in 2007 in the U.S. state of Kansas. 18-year-old Kelsey Smith mysteriously disappeared after going to the store. What happened to Kelsey attracted the media attention, and CCTV footage helped to solve this case. Kelsey Ann Smith was born on May 3, 1989, in Overland Park, Johnson County, Kansas. Kelsey was one of five children of Greg and Missy Smith. She graduated from Shawnee Mission West High School on May 24, 2007, and was looking forward to attending college in the fall. People knew her as an outgoing and friendly person. Her sense of humor did not leave anyone indifferent. She played the clarinet in a marching band, Kelsey worked at the AMC Movie Theater. On June 2, 2007, she had another shift. That morning, her mother Missy was leaving for a friend's wedding. Unaware that her family's life would irrevocably change and that she would never see her daughter alive again, Missy said goodbye to Kelsey before leaving. Kelsey went to work by car, which her parents gave her. Her morning shift ended without any incident. After work, she met her father and her sister, Lindsay. Together, they went to an amusement park. It was a wonderful day, which unfortunately did not have a happy ending. At about 6 p.m., Kelsey decided to go shopping. She asked her sister if she wanted to keep her company, but the latter refused. Therefore, Kelsey left the house alone and drove to the nearest Target department store. Before leaving, she told her father, Greg, about her plans and said she loved him. Greg was a policeman who loved his children madly. The man taught them basic self-defense techniques and to always take safety precautions. About an hour later, Kelsey called her mother, who was going home from a friend's wedding, and said she was shopping. They had a short conversation and agreed to see each other at home. After some time, John, Kelsey's boyfriend, arrived at Smith's home. John was one of those guys who inspired Greg's confidence. He often spent time at their house, and everyone believed their relationship would eventually grow into something more. That evening, Kelsey went to the store to buy a gift for John. The latter tried to call her but couldn't get through. He went to her house, but she wasn't there. Greg started calling his daughter, but she did not answer. After many unsuccessful attempts to contact Kelsey, Greg became worried. As a policeman, he tried to remain calm, but as a father, he was getting more concerned with every new minute. Greg started calling his daughter's friends, but no one knew where Kelsey might be or why she wasn't answering calls and texts. Kelsey wasn't like her peers. She always called her family, even if she was a few minutes late. After some time, John and Kelsey's sister, Lindsay, got into their car and started driving around the area, hoping to find Kelsey's car. What if she got into an accident? Maybe the police pulled her over for speeding. They first checked the parking lots at various stores. In one of them, they saw a Buick belonging to Kelsey. She told her father she was going to the Target store. However, they found her car near another store. John checked the car, but Kelsey wasn't there. Lindsay called her father and said they found Kelsey's car. Greg told them not to touch anything, as the car could be a potential crime scene. After all, if this was the case, it was crucial not to destroy the evidence possibly left there. Greg contacted the police and reported his daughter missing. The police launched an official investigation. The detectives immediately arrived at the place where John and Lindsay found Kelsey's car. The first odd thing that Greg and everyone else noticed was that her car wasn't in the Target parking lot. It was next to another store in a poorly lit part of the parking lot. The detectives carefully examined the car, hoping to find anything helpful to finding Kelsey. But the only things they found inside were a package, gift wrapping paper, and the gift the girl bought for her boyfriend, John. There was nothing inside the car that would indicate a crime. There were no signs of a struggle, no traces of blood, nothing like that. The keys were under the driver's seat. But then detectives saw something strange and suspicious. They saw some fabric that looked like a t-shirt sticking out of the trunk. With anxiety in his heart, Greg opened the trunk. It was empty. Kelsey was not there. 
She bought her gift for John at Target. It meant she was there at some point. Forensic experts thoroughly examined the car and found a thumbprint on the seatbelt. It did not belong to Kelsey or anyone with access to the car. Kelsey had just graduated from high school and was going to attend the University of Kansas, planning to become a veterinarian. She was always an exemplary student. Kelsey was a very ambitious and cheerful girl. She had her whole life ahead of her, but now she had mysteriously disappeared and her family desperately needed answers. The police continued their work. However, apart from an unidentified fingerprint, there was no evidence to indicate that her car was a crime scene. It seemed like someone just left the car in this parking lot. The detectives went to Target to get new information about Kelsey's disappearance. The CCTV footage could give answers to some questions. By the time the officers arrived, the store was already closed. It was about 11 p.m., but they still found the person who let them in and showed them the recordings. The police spent several hours at the monitors, tracking Kelsey's every move. But her trip to the store was ordinary. She found the necessary goods, paid for them, and went to the parking lot. There were no signs that something was wrong. While in the store, Kelsey did not quarrel or talk with anyone. She was calm and left there alone. But here's what seemed strange. After Kelsey got into the car, she, for some reason, drove in the opposite direction from her house. The recording's quality was low, and it was impossible to see any details. Thus, several more important questions arose. Why didn't Kelsey go home as planned? Did she drive the car herself? Could she have been hiding of her own free will? Before dawn, Greg and Missy went to the police station where detectives asked them various questions. Being a policeman, Greg knew that this was a common practice. When investigating such cases, detectives need to eliminate the possibility that someone from the family may be involved in the crime. He knew that the sooner he and Missy answered the questions, the sooner they would stop being suspects and the sooner the police would focus on finding other leads. The couple answered all the questions. Kelsey's parents weren't the suspects. The next person the police wanted to check for involvement in Kelsey's disappearance was her boyfriend, John. After all, Kelsey had spent most of her free time with him in the last few days, and he was the last person she had contact with. They needed to know where John had been before he went into Kelsey's house and told her father he couldn't contact her. Partners are often directly related to what happened to their soulmates. Therefore, the detectives decided to pressure the guy. They started asking him the same but differently phrased questions to see how he would react and whether he would change his story. It lasted about two hours, but John was adamant that he was not involved in Kelsey's disappearance and that everything was fine in their relationship. He answered all their questions and allowed the detectives to examine the contents of his phone. The officers were inclined to believe that John was probably not lying and that he had nothing to do with Kelsey's disappearance. But still, the detectives didn't cross him off the suspects list. Kelsey's family could not just sit and wait, so they started their unofficial investigation. Greg knew perfectly well that if someone had abducted his daughter, then with each new hour, the probability of finding her alive decreased. Greg, Missy, and John gathered people ready to help and divided them into groups to search the area. Each volunteer took a bundle of printed missing person flyers and walked around the needed streets, asking if anyone had seen Kelsey. Greg also called radio stations and asked for some airtime. He asked to tell about his daughter's disappearance and that anyone with any valuable information should contact the police or the Smith family. An hour after the radio stations reported Kelsey's disappearance, TV channels told about Kelsey in the news. It increased the chances of finding Kelsey as soon as possible. Her classmates joined the search. They went from one door to another. Perhaps someone from the residence heard or saw something suspicious, or something that did not arouse suspicion at first glance, but could help in the investigation. Any information was crucial. 
One of the questions the police had to answer was where Kelsey was for three hours from when she left Target until John and Lindsay discovered her car. To answer this question, the investigators again turned to the surveillance cameras. The parking lot where they found Kelsey's car belonged to another store. Fortunately, there were cameras there too. However, due to the recording's poor quality and insufficient lighting in that part of the parking lot, the detectives could not see anything that would allow them to understand where Kelsey had gone. They saw how her car drove into the unlit area of the parking lot, after which the headlights went out. Soon after, the driver got out of the car and left. But it was only a silhouette of a person. It was unclear whether it was Kelsey or someone else. The police were disappointed. As for Kelsey's family, they believed it was a good sign. The family members knew that she had no reason to hide. The most important thing for them was to find Kelsey alive. The police had no new leads yet, so they decided to look at the recordings from Target surveillance cameras again. But now the detectives used better monitors. They retracked Kelsey's every move while she was inside the store but didn't find anything suspicious. Everything seemed normal. Kelsey bought the necessary goods and left the store like any other customer. Parking lot? What could have happened there that led to Kelsey's disappearance? Even though the recording's quality was poor, the detectives still found a suspicious detail. After Kelsey left the store, she went to the parking lot to her car and opened the back door to put the purchased goods. Then, she went to the driver's door. At that moment, the investigators saw a blurry spot flashing after her. The police believed that someone attacked Kelsey when she got into the car, which meant they were dealing with an abduction. The investigators watched the recording over and over again, but the viewing angle and the quality of the recording did not allow them to see the whole picture. It took about 15 seconds before the door closed and the car left the parking lot. Perhaps her car turned in the opposite direction from her house because she wasn't the one who was behind the wheel or someone threatened her. Detectives didn't want to but had to tell Kelsey's parents that their daughter was most likely the victim of an abduction. All that was at the police's disposal was a video recording of the moment of the abduction, but it was impossible to see the person who did it. This person was wearing a white t-shirt and dark shorts. Therefore, the investigators again turned to target CCTV footage, but this time, they hoped to see someone wearing a white t-shirt and dark shorts. And then they saw something that they had not noticed before. A man in a white t-shirt and dark shorts followed Kelsey wherever she went. He kept his distance so Kelsey wouldn't suspect anything, but he was always there. There was no doubt that this man was following Kelsey. When Kelsey approached checkout to pay for the goods, he unhurriedly headed for the exit. He obviously left the store first to wait for her in the parking lot. Soon after, the police managed to get a clearer image of his face. It wasn't of perfect quality, but they hoped someone would identify this person. The police asked for help from the community to identify the man. The number of calls with possible leads exceeded a thousand. It took a lot of time to check this amount of data. Detectives tried to filter out the information that probably had nothing to do with the case. The police interrogated several people who looked like this man but none of them was the one they needed to find. The breakthrough in this case happened after the police tracked down Kelsey's phone. After she disappeared, her phone was active in a wooded area near Longview Lake, Missouri, about 15 miles from Target. By this time, the FBI had joined the investigation. They organized the search in the area where Kelsey's phone was last active. About 200 people took part in it. Kelsey was found four days after her abduction and just 45 minutes after her cell phone company provided information about her cell phone activity. That's worth paying special attention to. We'll come back to this issue later. Unfortunately, she was dead. The criminal tried to hide the traces of the crime, leaving her body under the leaves and tree branches. Kelsey was naked, which revealed the motive of this crime. Her belongings were a few feet away from her. During the forensic examination, the experts determined that Kelsey died of strangulation. The criminal used her own belt to take her life. 
The police had to tell her parents the worst news of their lives. The news about Kelsey's death was heartbreaking for her family and friends. The criminal was still out there, and the police needed to find him as soon as possible because they feared he might kidnap someone else. All the police had at this investigation stage was CCTV footage. Therefore, the investigators decided to study them again. Knowing that someone abandoned Kelsey's car in the parking lot at 9.17 p.m., the officers decided to look at what was happening in the Target parking lot during the same time. They saw a man running up to a dark pickup truck parked in the parking lot, getting inside, and quickly driving away. It was at 9.22 p.m., but it could have been a coincidence that had nothing to do with this case. It was already dark when the pickup truck left the Target parking lot. But what if the person driving that car arrived there during daylight hours? The investigators rewound the recording and it confirmed their assumptions. The blue pickup truck pulled into the Target parking lot at 6.55 p.m. Kelsey drove into the parking lot a minute later, parking next to this pickup truck by some evil coincidence. Perhaps that's when the criminal saw her for the first time. The police released images of the pickup truck and a man following Kelsey, hoping someone would identify him. And it brought results. Two people called the police station, saying they knew the man in this picture. One of the callers identified himself as his colleague and the other as a friend. Both callers gave the same name, Edwin Hall. He was 26 years old, owned a pickup truck, was married, and had a son. Looking up his past, the police discovered that whilst Hall had no adult convictions, he had a juvenile record after threatening his adoptive sister with a bread knife at 15 years old. If Hall was the one who abducted and took the life of Kelsey Smith, then he could have tried to hide after his image appeared in the news. Therefore, the police went to his home right away. When the police arrived, they saw Hall putting things in his car. He was going to leave with his family, but the police got to him faster. They arrested Edwin Hall and took him to a police station for questioning. He told detectives that he had nothing to do with the disappearance and death of Kelsey Smith. He said he didn't even know who she was. But everyone knew he was lying because the CCTV footage from Target left no doubt that Hall was following Kelsey. When they told him about the recording that could refute his words, he admitted he watched Kelsey because he liked her legs. But Edwin continued denying any contact with Kelsey after she left the store. He agreed to provide the police with his DNA sample and fingerprints so that they would exclude him from the list of suspects. Hall was sure he had left no trace, but he was wrong to think that. His thumbprint matched the one found on the seatbelt in Kelsey's car. This information directly connected Hall with the abduction and death of Kelsey Smith. After all, there was no other explanation for his fingerprint being on the seatbelt. Hence, no matter what Edwin Hall said, the police knew he was the one who ran up to Kelsey in the parking lot. After the detectives informed him about the fingerprint match, he decided not to wait for the DNA result and confessed everything. To avoid the death penalty, Hall agreed to tell all the details of the crime he committed. He said he liked Kelsey when he saw her in the Target parking lot. Hall started following her while she was shopping and then waited until she came to the car. After this, he pulled his gun and attacked her. Hall pushed her into her car and drove her to a wooded area outside the city. There, he told Kelsey to undress and eventually ended up taking her life because he was afraid that she would tell everything. Then Hall hid Kelsey's body under branches and leaves and drove back. After leaving Kelsey's car in a nearby parking lot, he went to Target, where he previously parked his pickup truck, and then drove home. After the death of Kelsey, Missy and Greg Smith said they noticed the majority of violent crimes were geared toward children and young adults. We wanted to prevent this from happening to others, Missy Smith said. With that goal in mind, they created safety awareness seminars. Greg Smith was a police officer at the time of his daughter's death, so he used the training methods he learned on the force and applied them to a civilian setting. The Kelsey Smith Act passed in Kansas in 2009, and similar laws exist in 23 other states. However, in 2016, 
it failed to pass the U.S. House of Representatives. Members of Congress who voted against the bill cited privacy issues in allowing law enforcement to access information without subpoenas. The Smiths point out only location would be released, so texts, pictures, and phone calls would be off limits. For 13 years now, the couple has been pushing for change in Congress. One thing keeps them going. It's Kelsey. There's no doubt about it. It's Kelsey, Greg Smith said. She was 18 years old and a recent high school graduate when she walked out of a Target in Overland Park and disappeared. It took four days for a cell phone company to release location information from her phone. Once it did, police found her body within 45 minutes. The Smiths dedicated their lives to passing legislation to expedite that process for other families. It would have saved four days of hunting for her and not knowing if your child was alive or what her outcome was, Missy Smith said. If law enforcement determines there's an emergency situation, the Kelsey Smith Act requires wireless communication providers to turn over a device's location information. It also provides immunity to the phone company for doing so. Bottom line is, it's a tool for law enforcement. We live in a technology world, and why not give them every tool they need to find somebody? Greg Smith said. The legislation says the information should be released if officers assert the phone was used to call 911 in the preceding 48 hours, or if there's reason to believe someone is at risk of death or serious physical harm. In September 2008, the jury found Edwin Hall guilty on all counts. During the trial, he apologized to Kelsey's family and said he was very sorry. The court sentenced him to life imprisonment without the possibility of parole. During the 16 years since her death, Kelsey, who would have turned 34 on May 3rd, has become the face of a movement to force telecommunications providers to be responsive in emergency situations, especially as GPS and cell phone technology has continued to improve and evolve.